Okay, lovely. Th thank you all for coming for the, um, uh, the first uh, social and political sciences faculty seminar of the term. Uh, today I'm very pleased to introduce Juan Brito, who is a professor at the University of Los Andes in Chile. He's also a journalist and a Master of Arts in Law and Diplomacy, uh, which he received from the Fletcher School at Tufts University in the United States. And he's been an editor at uh, various Chilean newspapers and magazines and covered world affairs for more than two decades. He is a columnist in uh, newspapers and digital publications in Chile and Spain. And I'm very pleased to say that he's currently a uh, PhD student with us um, at, uh, here at the University of Lincoln. And uh, today, uh, Juan is going to talk to us about, um, he's going to sort of summarize uh, part of his PhD project, Power or Principle, the Rise and Fall of the Liberal International Order in the Post-Cold War Period. Take it away, Juan. Thank you, Nick. Let me thank Nick especially for this, and also Harris, who have been my tutors in this adventure. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about is part of my research project, uh, which deals with perceived ideas or perceived impact of ideas in the design and implementation of foreign policy in the post-Cold War period. So let me begin with the very basic, and then we will, from the general to the concrete, and then we will end up talking about international politics in the, in the post-Cold War period. Uh, and of course, it's very basic in international politics is that anarchy is the defining feature of international politics. And anarchy is, of course, the opposite of hierarchy. And in hierarchy, what you have is that units have differentiated roles. In anarchy, you have like units, as Ken Waltz used to say, like units that do the same. And when and doing the same, they collide and they enter probably into conflict. And so the, there's a lack of a central authority to impose uh, rules. And uh, in that case, without a central authority and everybody trying to do the same, the conflict will, uh, conflict will most surely arise. And what is that they are all doing uh, at the same time is they're searching for security. In, in an environment with no central authority, security is, a, is the main concern. But in searching for their own security, uh, they, they tend, uh, each unit tends to create insecurity for the rest. So nobody is really safe in, a, in an anarchic system because of what is called the security dilemma. Uh, and some uh, authors, uh, assimilate this stage of anarchy to uh, the state of nature described by Thomas Hobbes, where life is short, brutish, and nasty. So nobody wants to live in that kind, in that kind of world, uh, where you can uh, you can die in any occasion. So uh, units create orders in order to intervene anarchy, and and. Uh, in international politics, an international order is defined by some uh, key features. Hedley Bull, who uh, taught, uh, wrote about um, the international uh, uh, system and the international order, he said that political orders had to, uh, uh, units integrated into political orders because of three reasons, they're all searching for three goods. And he taught about life, he said, any uh, unit would like to, of course, survive. And this is why they abandon anarchy and try to integrate into an order. They try to continue possessing what they possess. Uh, and this is why he talked about property. And they want everybody to uh, be true to their work or accept the commitments that they had uh, come into in order to create uh, the order. So and that would be truth. So he said, any unit that wants a political order will try to uh, uh, ensure that they, they keep life, they get truth, and they get uh, 
uh, order, sorry, um, property. So these are the three uh, conditions that anybody who enters into a political order is seeking. In terms of, of international order, he added some uh, features. As he said, well, an international order should seek peace among the, the units, should um, try to, uh, should respect sovereignty of each unit, and uh, also should try to self-preserve itself. So the order wants to promote peace, respect sovereignty, and uh, self-preserve itself. Henry Kissinger, who has studied this also, adds another feature. He says a, a order must look for legitimacy. So everybody is happy and accepts the order as legitimate. And Bull adds also that a political order to be efficient and working must also have uh, rules and values and common interests. The units must share these rules, values, and common interests. So that, uh, that is a brief description of an international political order. There are many international orders. The most typical, of course, is it what in, in international relations is called the traditional paradigm, which is balance of power, which was uh, used for a long while, for centuries after the, the Muslim peace in 1648 until the First World War. But the international order that I'm interested in is the liberal international order, which is a specific kind of uh, order. Um, the, in, the liberal international order is based on the Enlightenment ideas. It was, uh, it has been uh, implemented in a process. I think <coughs> they, probably the, the first one to, who started to implement it were, were the British in the 19th century. Uh, especially in the economic realm, in the in what we might call the, the trade realm, the trade trade laws, corn laws, etc., uh, and free freedom of navigation were uh, key issues for the this proto uh, liberal international order world that was created by the by the British in the 19th century. But who really implemented it and, and were dedicated to it were the Americans in the 20th century. There's an, an initial effort by President Woodrow Wilson after the end of, the, of World War I to implement it through the League of Nations. But as you know, America did not uh, ratify the treaty over say uh, when he came back to the US. So America uh, continued to be uh, isolated from the, relatively isolated from the, uh, from international politics in the interwar period. So. Uh, that was an attempt only, and not a, the concretion or, or the uh, or the participation of the Americans in the in the in a liberal international order. They tried to restrain themselves from international politics. After World War II, there was another attempt, especially by by President Roosevelt and President Truman, and this attempt was more serious. The Americans. Uh, rejected isolationism and became part of the global polit politics, uh, very intensely, of course. And, of course, they did intervene in world affairs against the Soviet Union, and they implemented some sort of in a liberal international order, but it was uh, restricted by two reasons. One, restricted to Western countries by two reasons. One, of course, the Cold War, their priority was to fight or to contain the Soviet Union during the Cold War. And second, because of the Cold War, they had to betray the idea, the, the liberal internationalism ideas, in supporting um, dictatorships around the world, since uh, they opposed, these dictatorships were opposed to the Soviet Union. So the priority was the security issue with the Soviet Union and, and the U.S. Uh, promoted a liberal order, but restrained to Western countries in, in Western Europe and also in Japan. Now, the, the, the success stories of the liberal international order in the post-Cold post, uh, 
Second World War period are uh, Japan and Germany. And Italy probably as well. If you can say that Italy is a, is a success story at all. Uh, and then after the, the end of the Cold War, uh, the Americans had it to, to make a choice. They had a choice in front of them. Should they go back and restrain themselves and take their peace dividend and um, worry about their own problems, or should they uh, go full speed, uh, full speed ahead with the liberal international project? And there was a, a key election, I would say the key election then was a 92 election where you have all these choices on the table. You had a, a um, President Bush and, and candidate Clinton, who were for the international solution, especially uh, uh, President Bush. And you had Ross Perot, who, who was a, an independent candidate. And also you had in the, in the Republican primaries, you had Pat Buchanan, who was a challenger to President Bush. And they, Buchanan and Perot, expressed what we would call the today the, the populist solution and the isolationist solution. So they, they said we shouldn't have free trade, that was Ross Perot. We shouldn't have uh, become involved with free trade. And Buchanan said we should isolate ourselves back into the American frontiers and do not take uh, be in charge of the world. We shouldn't be the policemen of the world. But of course they lost and Clinton won. And after the, the in, during the post Cold War period, what you had is that the U.S. went uh, um, intensively for the liberal international project, and um, liberal international project or liberal international order can be described as a grand strategy. A grand strategy is a, a set of overarching premises that link ends, ways, and means. And um, this is a sort of big idea from which policies and decisions are derived. And concrete solutions are designed. But regarding this great idea, so international liberalism is that kind of grand strategy. And of course, uh, international liberalism was the grand strategy of the US during the post-Cold War period. Uh, the, so this is the idea that inspired concrete policies. Uh, G. John Eikenberry, who probably is, is the foremost uh, scholar, most important scholar dedicated to study and to promote uh, <coughs> as well uh, liberal internationalism, has established a, a set of five ideas that shape liberal visions of international order. He says, and a liberal international order must contain openness and trade, free trade, of course, uh, rules and institutions. So this is why we keep uh, hearing about the rules-based world order. Uh, liberal democratic solidarity, including the idea of democratic peace, uh, cooperative security, and progressive social purposes, because liberal do think that progress, that, that history moves towards progress. So you have to uh, promote those, those ideas as well. What you don't see here, except for cooperative security, is the idea of power. So liberals believe that these conditions should be enough in order to tame anarchy and in order to provide peace, as we said uh, bull required that for an international order peace must be sovereignty must be respected uh, and, this, and the order must self-preserve so with this set of ideas and conditions uh, i can very and, and, and liberal internationalists will say this is enough we don't need power really actually uh, this was even uh, said by uh, hillary clinton when she was a the Secretary of State of the, of the United States. She said, we will forget about real politics. We are dismantling real, uh, real politics or 
real politique. And, and uh, what we are now, we, we don't care about a national interest anymore. We have common interests, and we are pushing towards a globalization, which is to create this whole world market, and we are pushing uh, ahead in a world that is so integrated that national interests are not uh, the principal preoccupation of, of states. So what you have from Clinton to Obama, uh, with, of course with George W. Bush in, 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 in between, is that they used, decide, the U.S. decided and implemented uh, this policy with, uh, regarding this great idea, with this grand strategy of liberal internationalism, and policies that promoted this idea. And this was, for example, Clinton, you have uh, Clinton established as a, as, a, as a purpose of his um, foreign policy, democracy, democracy enlargement. And uh, of course, he, he was behind the compression and the creation of, uh, of the World Trade Organization in 1995. He promoted the, the, the accession of China to World Trade Organization as well. Uh, Bush, who, who came to power in 2001, of course, he, he was a, he was elected. There's a, a little parenthesis here, but if you look at each of these three presidents that I'm naming, Obama, uh, Bush, and Clinton, all of them were elected not on internationalist platforms. They were elected because they uh, promised to take care of U.S. business and domestic issues before the end. You can remember the, the it's democracy stupid lemma of, or or um, and the phrase of the Clinton campaign. Bush was was a, a governor of Texas. He had barely any international experience, and he 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 was famous or he, he became famous in the U.S. because he introduced an educational reform. And of course, Obama came to power essentially to. Uh, to deal with the economic crisis in 2008. So uh, all of them were, although they, their platform was uh, domestic, they uh, pushed for this liberal international uh, order anyway. So Bush, who came to power preoccupied mostly for domestic issues, had to deal with the 9-11 attacks. So his agenda was transformed, but even though he uh, he concentrated on the war of on terror, uh, he pushed within the war of terror for what he called the freedom agenda, and he tried to create uh, democracies where never had been a, a democracy before <coughs> in Iraq and Afghanistan, and he he insisted that. Uh, for example, Iraq would become a sort of a shining light in the hill for the rest of the Arab countries, an example that the, the rest of the Arab countries could not resist when they realized that, that a democracy it was possible in, in Iraq. They wouldn't resist, and they would become uh, democracies as well. And in the Freedom Agenda, in his uh, inaugural uh, speech in, in 2005 for his second administration, he declared uh, that the U.S. would oppose anywhere in the world uh, uh, the development of, of uh, tyrants, tyrannies. So tyranny was the, the was the enemy, and the U.S. would oppose and and depose the tyrannies everywhere in the world and promote democracy. And of course, Obama, especially in the first. In the first, uh, in his first administration, because the second administration of Obama is more a transitional one towards a different world, I would say, uh, also had this uh, this um, uh, liberal internationalist approach to foreign uh, 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 policy. This uh, approach was uh, evident, for example, in his Cairo speech. He went to Cairo and delivered a speech to. to Offer uh, the Muslim world a new a new deal, and he was also uh, 
very close to China and very open to China in the belief that if the old belief that if, if the, the West and of course the US cooperated with China and helped China to be a developed economy, um, China would end up becoming uh, more friendly to the West and of course even probably uh, there would be a middle class that would demand changes in terms of political liberalization. And of course, he insisted in creating a democracy in Afghanistan, although he withdrew the, the American troops from, from, uh, from uh, Iraq. Well, this is what all these three administrations did. But at the same time that this was happening, other forces were in, uh, taking place as well. One was that the US um, emphasis on liberal internationalism began to be affected by some uh, uh, phenomena or events. The first, of course, was 9-11 and, and its aftermath. The aftermath of 9-11 of was the Iraq invasion, the Afghan, of first, first of all, the Afghan invasion, Iraq invasion, the war on terror, and the way in which the war on terror was fought, which was a, we can say, a dirty war with the with tortures, I don't know if you remember, perhaps you're, I'm the oldest in the room, so I guess uh, I remember better than you, but, but uh, the, the Americans started to, to debate if waterboarding was or, was or wasn't a, a form of torture, and there were secret prisons around the world where prisoners of Al Qaeda were taken to and interrogated very harshly. And all this started to decrease American prestige and, and American moral standard as a world leader. In, um, and so at the end of his government or administration, President Bush was called a toxic Texan by some people. Uh, so the American moral standard had fallen. And of course, Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, the wars in those countries started very well for the Americans. They could depose the, the Taliban in Afghanistan. They deposed, uh, they provoked a regime change in, in Iraq. Uh, Saddam Hussein was caught and, 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 and the new government was created, but uh, things became complicated. And so uh, the wars, which were kind of popular in the beginning in the US, became a, 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 an issue. And the Americans lost the appetite for intervention and for nation building. And at the same time, what Farid Zakaria has, has called the rise of the rest was taking place. So we had a, of course, China was becoming a different country and starting to become a superpower. And there were other countries as well that um, started to speak with their own voice. And we had the BRICS, you know, you know that acronym, which is Brazil, Russia, India and China, and then South Africa as well. And they, had, they started to, to start to talk on their own and not to live under the umbrella of the US. I would say it's kind of a rebellion, a peaceful rebellion, but a rebellion in any case. So the, the situation started to change. And uh, I would say this is this was, this became evident at, in, uh, during the Obama's second administration, well, where you had a the the Crimean invasion by by Russia, for example, which was of course challenged to liberal internationalism. You have the the, the arrival of power, to power of, of Secretary General Xi Jinping in, in China, who had a new and different approach to the. Chinese status in the world, and um, you have the consequences of the Arab Spring in in, a, in the Arab world, and you have this uh, two two I would say very damaging uh, decisions by the Obama administration in terms of of what the power standing of the U.S. was in that period. One is that uh, in, in some moment Obama said that there was a red line that he would not accept the, the Syrian government to, to cross, which was the use of uh, weapons of mass destruction against civilians. And he said, uh, if that happened, 
if the Syrian government used those kind of weapons against civilians, he would, America would intervene in the war. And that happened. They used uh, chemical weapons, and America did not intervene. And the other was that when the Libyan civil war erupted, the Americans uh, opted to, this is a, uh, a sentence mentioned by some American official, to lead from behind. Um, so they, not, they did not intervene. It was in the 90s or early 2000s that would have been unthinkable. Americans did intervene in Somalia in, Somalia in the 90s. Uh, and Haiti, they, they sent troops to say Haiti in 1992. So a, a, a different world was uh, was being created, and th this was the evidence. America had lost the appetite for intervention, and and uh, it is not that Obama did not want. We don't know, but of course he could not. He would have been a political suicide to intervene in those uh, in those crises. So the Russians intervened in in Syria another challenge to liberal internationalism. Uh, there were, there, there were uh, some clashes last year or the year before in, between China and India. You have India now becoming a, a, a regional superpower in, in their part of the world. You have Japan starting under former Premier uh, Shinzo Abe starting to discuss and, and to implement reforms to their pacifist co uh, uh, constitution in order to be able to send troops abroad. And there's some level of debate today in Japan about do they need uh, to develop their own um, uh, nuclear weapons because of the Chinese and the North Korean uh, threat. So what you have now is, is a world where I would say in transition to a different order out of the liberal international uh, project towards a different world, which is more based in national interest and, and old-style politics or even real politics. So uh, the, the issue that hangs around this, this, this uh, liberal international order is what motivated and why was it implemented and how was it implemented? And the question is that is liberal, did, did liberal international, uh, did the liberal international order prevail because it was a good idea for that moment? Or did it prevail because there was a unipolar power that implemented it and supported it and pushed for it? So liberals would say this is a good idea and we have to reframe it and, and try again. And Others will say, well, the thing is that unipolarity was an accident in history, a very rare situation that will very, uh, that it, it's very unlikely that it will, it will repeat itself for a while at least. So we have to forget about implementing liberal internationalism as it was implemented after the post Cold War period. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, so we can take questions uh, both on Teams, hopefully, if, um, if people on Teams are <coughs> watching through the, um, the YouTube um, thing, and, and also from people in the room. Um, so uh, th thanks very much for giving us a lot to think about. Fantastic. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, my question is, how do you see the relationship between political power and economic power? Uh, you see, can we think about international Liberalism. Is there a relationship? What I mean is that in the last two decades, China and Russia currently has grown, and is this one of the ways that international liberalism failed, or as an ideology, it was room to be failed? Obviously, the relationship between political power and economic power. Well, in the, in the liberal project, of course, there is a relationship. Not not in terms of, of real real politics. They, they go hand in hand because what you're promoting is freedom at the end, and freedom and progress, which is the, the idea that history has a sense and that the history is moving in the, in the sense of liberty or freedom 
and the uh, idea of progress. So they go hand in hand in terms that democracy should uh, is a sister and, uh, and, uh, and almost an inevitable companion of free markets or vice versa, we'd say. So free markets are go with democracy and democracy goes with uh, free markets. So, and of course, if you believe in that, and, and of course there, there are numbers that would justify that as well. During a period, there was a huge economic growth associated with uh, globalization and, and free markets and democracies, or at least liberalization. So in that sense, they go together. But uh, they also go together, or they, or they, they all, they, there's a relationship between power and, and an economic development that can mean exactly the opposite, in the case of China, for example. The liberal uh, assumption was that China would become more uh, open if, uh, if it developed its economy. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, you have this, all these uh, development economists and, and theorists that would say Seymour uh, Lipset. Lipset. Lipset and uh, of course, Samuel Huntington as well, who would say that when you uh, create, when you have a rapid uh, uh, economic development, um, what you create is a, is a middle class, and that middle class uh, will start sooner or later demanding uh, political rights. So what happened in China was exactly that. You were having a very strong uh, um, economic uh, growth, and then you would have, according to these theories, you would have a, a growing middle class that would demand a reform and political liberalization, not necessarily democracy, but at least some sort of political liberalization. The Chinese had that, but they cut that in 1989. And they decided not to have, uh, and so there are others that say that there's an implicit pact between the Chinese people and the and the Chinese Communist Party would say, well, you give us uh, a better quality of life by economic growth, and we don't really demand uh, political liberalization. But anyway, what has happened in China is that economic growth has led to a, a I would say, a more conscious uh, superpower. And what they are demanding now is respect, and they are demanding their own place in the world. So economic growth for them meant power, and they they they, they feel now. And if you listen to what uh, Secretary General Xi Jinping said on Monday, I think what you hear is a superpower saying, "We will not be fooled around by anybody. We we need respect. We won't intervene in, in others." Uh, uh, domestic issues, but we won't respect. We want uh, Taiwan back. It's, our, it's part of our country, and uh, and we will fight for it. Even we might fight for it if, if somebody challenges that. So economic power uh, and economic growth meant for, for the Chinese uh, more uh, self-assurance and self-confidence in, in, in behaving as a traditional power with when that promotes its own self-interest. And in Russia, you might say the same uh, with, with, uh, with Putin. And, and he had a very good economic run because of the commodity um, super cycle. And he, he amassed a lot of money. And, and he became very popular because of that. And, and he, he has gained self, and Russia has gained self-confidence as well to behave as a, as a um, as a superpower, a traditional superpower. So you might say that for a liberal, this shouldn't have happened. From a, from a liberal and a develop, 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 developmental, <laughs> developmental uh, point of view. We have a couple of questions uh, that have come in uh, from remotely as well. So we can, we'll can we do at least one of them and then see what, um, what's going on over there. So it just, yeah, we've got one from David Hughes. Um, how do the concepts of capitalism and imperialism fit into your assessment of the liberal international order. So I think definitely relates a bit to, to Barish's uh, question. So perhaps 
You talked a bit about free markets. So where do you see imperialism, especially with your history of Britain fitting in uh, into your model? Well, the, 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 of course, it is related. And in some, if, if you look at, especially from a Marxist point of view, you, what, you, what you would see is imperialism, pure. Mm -hmm. so, and of course, in the British period, and all this thing of the white, bird, white man's burden and all of that kind of stuff, uh, the, the British thought that they were carrying also the civilization towards the, the colonies. And of course, the Americans as well. Uh, the, Americans, you, you, the, uh, the American national myth, uh, they see themselves, honestly, I would say, as a, as a benign power, a power that, that not only uh, um, promotes democracy, not only promotes its own national self-interest, uh, um, self but also uh, uh, has a universal recipe for success. Mm. And of course, uh, I, I, would, I would say that they this is funny of the Americans, and this is why uh, Henry Kissinger says that America is, a, is an ambivalent superpower. Because at the same time that they promote principle, they're promoting national self-interest, mm -hmm. and, and they live very peacefully with that. They don't they don't uh, ask themselves much questions about this. They they, they, they I, I think and he thinks that they they really believe that that they're promoting their benign society, their benign superpower. Uh, but if you look at it from a, from a different point of view, or especially a Marxist or neo-Marxist point of view, it's pure and simple imperialism, and Americans behave imperialistic, imperialistically during that period uh, and imposing their own recipe for their own sake and for their own good in order to exploit the, the colonies. Let's see. Let's take another question from the room. Um, yeah, I just wondering if you thought about the sort of like breakdown of the little words in the context of issues that I suppose are like global in nature, like climate change and biodiversity loss. Like on one hand, maybe you had that like liberal consensus that you needed to like find a way forward on global issues, but maybe it's more like anarchic competition of national interests. Obviously, like nations see that like tackling climate change is in their national interests. Yeah, this is a big issue for, for liberal internationalists. They would say that, of course, they are better prepared to provide these goods, for example, to promote uh, change in terms of, uh, or cooperation in terms of dealing with the uh, global um, um, the climate crisis, for example. So they would say, we are the ones that can provide that. And of course, the, the Paris uh, Agreement and uh, the Kyoto Agreement and all, all that kind of stuff came through during that period. It would, I would say it's more, much more difficult today. If you try to push for those agreements today, it would be much more difficult because national interests of the countries will, will uh, play a much more important role in negotiations and it probably would make them impossible. The results would be impossible. But in, in another sense, what you have in terms of diversity, what you have is uh, what Robert Kagan, which American scholar, he, he, called, he says that we were living in, under the, the liberal international project, an age of convergence. So everybody was alike. So you had a little diversity, really. Mm -hmm. So the, the world was converging into a, a single recipe, I would say. Mm -hmm. And then now you have what Kagan uh, says is the age of divergence. You have a lot of recipes going around and competing against each other. Uh, that makes it more difficult for cooperation, but it's more diverse, you see? So there's a trade-off there. I wouldn't be able to, to answer what is, uh, in terms of some issues, it's better for cooperation. In terms of diversity and, and uh, preservation of well, local cultures, for example, it would be Globalization is, is the enemy, of course, and uh, national cultures would defend it, uh, themselves against that. So it's it's a it's a mix. Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea. 
is democracy, as was especially on your analysis, an endangered concept going forward? I wouldn't say it's, it's an endangered concept, but I would say it has retreated. If you look at Freedom House's uh, uh, indexes, what you see, they label countries in free or not free, partially free, or et cetera. What you see is starting in, I think it's 2008 or, or seven, around that, that what you see is that uh, free countries are retreating. There are less free countries and many more partially free, partially non-free, or, or definitely non-free countries. So, so it's retreating, it's, under, it's in, in trouble, democracy is in trouble. And not only because of the totalitarian um, um, push from these countries and, and others, but also because of uh, internal dysfunctionalities, I would say. So you, what you have in many democracies is extreme polarization, difficult to, to get to agreements, <coughs> um, very slow uh, uh, provision of solutions to long problems, the problems that have been sitting there for a long while, health problems, immigration problems, uh, security problems, so each country has uh, its own list of own problems that when you look at them, what you see is that uh, they're, they're there forever. And for some reason, democracy and democratic governments have, haven't been able to solve them. And they, this has created a lot of anger and resentment among the population against elites. And that, that's why you have populists coming in, etc. Et so there's a problem from, from without and from within for democracy. And, and uh, of course, that makes it very stressful for democracies. Uh, this is a, a stressful moment for democracies, but I wouldn't say democracy is finished, but, but well, of course, I don't know, but yeah. But of course, the democracy is in difficult place. And uh, perhaps we'll go to Rico back in the room. Yeah, thanks very much. We'll follow up from some of the other questions. Um, so I was trying to get a handle on what your explanation is for the decline of the world. On, on the one hand, if you take the data's point from online, the, you know, the, the, the liberal order is to some extent masking imperialism, uh, sort of you know, capitalist interests, or the sort of fusion of political and economic uh, power. Um, I was just wondering, where does this decline lay? Does it, does, it, does, it, does it lie in the sort of the empty rhetoric of the liberal order, in, in the sense of the, the moral hubris that came with the collapse of communism? Democracy is the only game in town. Um, and then, but, and as you kind of sort of outline, and then fail or decline, when the fact is that morality or that moral hubris doesn't kind of stand up in relation to you know, Afghanistan or Iraq. Uh, the failure of democracy promotion, or the fact that you know, the leading uh, sort of purveyor of these, the liberal international order of the USA, doesn't necessarily respect you know, its own sort of standards of democracy. And then you get now, this is where you hit Putin now with his, with his rages about the, uh, the Western order not being able to kind of live up to its own, own rhetoric. So, do you sort of do, do you place the decline in the kind of paradoxes of the liberal order itself in terms of not being able to live up to its own kind of moral rhetoric? In about two minutes. Yeah. So I want to get one more question in. <laughs> well, oh, what I would say. Oh, okay. Okay. From, from a liberal point of view, this is, of course, my opinion, is that there is a mismatch between expectations and reality in the liberal international project. So the expectation is peace, that you can achieve peace by intervening the natural order, which would be anarchy. You see? You can intervene anarchy and defeat anarchy. Um, and the, the, the misunderstanding here is probably that what really uh, helped or helped to create the conditions under which um, the liberal international project was feasible was a singular, in particular, distribution of power within the system, which is unipolarity. So what you should the resort to explain the the, the success or the, the success for a while of the liberal international project is unipolarity, not the good ideas of um, 
the legal project that were around for a while, actually. And when the conditions ceased to exist in order to have a unipolar power, the liberal project started to crumble. So what you should look, I think, is that is the distribution of power within the system and not the good ideas of the grand strategy. But what they did is they, the, what liberal uh, internationalists uh, believe is that they had found the solution to human problems. And this is what Fukuyama says in his end of history, our fallen book. Okay, well, we, we, have, we have four minutes left, and I think two questions that I'd be very keen to hear. So, um, but that's a good, that's a good, good start. We're going to have coffee afterwards anyway. So, uh, Sam, would you, would you like to? Uh, uh, yes, um, and thank you for your, um, for your talk. I think um, my question relates and picks up on some of the strands of earlier uh, questions. I was, um, I was thinking it might be a bit too bold to ask, but and therefore the other question is bold. I'll, I'll come to you as well. Um, I wonder if even using and talking about nation states is relevant anymore, whether we're actually talking about the new term or the new discourse or new terminology for the, for the direction of travel and some of the issues that you're, you're discussing, that actually nation states aren't so intellectually coherent as, as to make them useful in analytics. It's an open kind of question. I yeah, it's a, it's a typical question, I would say. Uh, from from the 70s on, from multinationalism and that kind of stuff, or transnationalism. Um, I think that yes, and, and, and I would say that there is some evidence, recent evidence about that. For example, the pandemics. Mm -hmm. What happened in the pandemics? Uh, uh, what you had is that states took over, uh, governments. I, I don't know how, do you, do you say state? Or the the municipal the, governments. The, or the government. Uh, government, I mean the, the, the apparatus, the, the the government took over, and and and, the, and what you saw is that governments would steal each other, for example, masks or or these things to breathe, uh, machines, and and the French would take the Spanish, uh, would, into, would stop a plane that was going to Spain, and they would steal the, the mask or whatever uh, they had. So the states did play a role uh, when 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 push came to show. Uh, states appeared very much in force. And everybody thought, or well, many people thought, that, well, states don't count anymore, we, we can get rid of them. Well, look at what happened. And what, what yeah, is uh, Russia, if, 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 if Russia is, or, I mean, it's working as a state. You can say there's internal opposition to, to Putin or whatever, but what you see is a national state working very heavily and invading another, actually. So I would say, uh, the death, the, the news of the death of of of, uh, of the national states have been widely exaggerated. Okay, one and one final question from from online. So it's from Simon Obendorf. So another typically critical question: Do we need to account for potential ethnocentrism, ethnocentrism in this analysis? For instance, how might we assess the rise of alternative visions of an international order based in ideas of neo-Confucianism or communitarianism? Um, or Ubuntu um, Pan-Africanism in Africa. Um, is, is this not so much about multipolarity as it is about worldism or competing worldviews? Yeah, well, I would say that in the 90s and in the period that I'm, that I'm studying, of course, I'm, I'm looking at this from the American point of view. So it, it's, of course, this or the Western point of view you want. But of course, America is a, is a, is a hub of, the, of my investigation. Um, in, during the, the 90s and the, and the liberal internationalist period, I would say that exactly the opposite happened. I mean, what we had is that uh, national cultures, and, and this is why this idea of the, of the, of the national state being overrun by, by events and gain force, what you see is that we had globalization, so everybody was free market. And, and in the same way, everybody was participating in the same world market. And you had a single formula, really, whether, whether you like it or not. And, that, and, it, and this doesn't mean that there were other formulas around. There was a huge debate between uh, uh, Lee Kuan Yew 
and, and Americans, for example, about Asian values for a while. What had provoked the, the Asian miracle? Was it then the World Bank said, well, it's, it's just right policies applied. And Lee Kuan Yew insisted and said, no, this is Asian values. The Asian miracle is particular to the Asian region because we have these values regarding community and that kind of stuff. So, but I would say in the 90s and early 2000s, what you had is a prevailing recipe, and this recipe was coming from the U.S., uh, which had the force to enforce that uh, that uh, that regime. Thank you, Juan. Um, okay, we're we're only one minute over time, for, um, and I think we've had a really interesting discussion. Um, so thank you again for for uh, your for your presentation and fielding these questions. And I hope to see you all in two weeks for um, uh, Barish's uh, presentation as well. So thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, thank you.